Welcome to Open Your Reality. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chad, and today I have a very special guest on the show. His name is Tom Althaus. He's been on Open Your Reality before. Welcome back to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me, Chad. Glad to be back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those people who haven't watched our first interviews, uh, I want to bring people up to date on who you are and what's transpired, and then you can take it from there. So you are a screenplay writer, among other things. And in 1992, you wrote a screenplay called The Immortals. That's correct? That is correct. Okay. In 1993, you were invited by Warner Brothers to submit your, your uh, screenplay to their studios for consideration. And that's correct as well, right? I was actually, yes, Bonaventura. Lorenzo D. Bonaventura is the gentleman who had me pitch it to him. He is best friends with Lenny Coco, who was connected to Pat Robertson. So I was invited up to Lenny Coco's home to pitch it specifically to uh, Bonaventura, who then said he, we were going to make it. He's going to push it through and uh, had to submit through an attorney just so we could follow protocol. But he said he would make sure everything went through. Okay. And so uh, then fast forward to 1999, the, the Matrix movie comes out. Mm-hmm. And did you watch the movie when it originally came out? I was on a Shakespeare tour, international touring company, uh, Shenandoah Shakespeare Express, it's called, out of Virginia, Stan. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to see Matrix, not knowing what was involved, in 1999. I could not sit through the entire piece. I actually had to leave in the middle of it. I got sick and nauseous. I don't know if it was the way they filmed it or what, but I couldn't watch it through. I did see the Jacks in the Neck. I didn't think it was enough to, you know, I didn't think maybe it was a coincidence or something. I didn't put it together. But later, it was pointed out to me. Uh, scenes were shown to me. And I was like, wow, okay, this has been taken. Right. Uh, you, were, uh, you were an actor. That's why you were on that tour, right? Right. Performer, writer. Yeah. Okay. So then the the Matrix Reloaded, the Matrix Revolutions come out, and then... If we fast forward to what was it? What year did you see those movies? Actually, I didn't see two and three initially. In 2010, I was told uh, by the wife I had, who's actually <laughs> connected to Mike Lang at Disney, she um, let me see scenes. Little girl pointing at the sun, showed me that very scene. The um, train station, the little girl there, and uh, with her parents and dressed well. She showed me these different scenes and said, look, your, your work has been ripped off. That was at the end of 2009. That was done right at the statute of limitations for discovery. You have 10 years to discover, 1999, 2009. Warner Brothers wanted me to discover. They wanted to control the whole game, the ball game, and they made sure I saw it then. And so everything transpired at that point, which just blows my mind how they orchestrated it. Right. And so you saw that and you you saw that there were many instances. You cite 166 in all that they took from from your work. Is that correct? Still growing. Yeah, we have a team now, a documentary team. We're finding more and more things. <clears throat> and it's also t- turning up in their um, affiliate pieces, such as uh, Star Trek, um, Into the Darkness, wherever it is. Um, Man in the High Castle is loaded with everything. That was a real mockery one. That was a Philip K. Dick novel, right? Yeah, Philip K. Dick wrote these things, and he, from what I understand, he had said he doesn't want his work altered. So along comes Spielberg and the rest of the teams, and they alter his work, specifically alter his work when he was against his wishes. Then they wrote a book saying they think he would be pleased. They altered everything to stick my stuff in and make a blend. And one of the cases you can see right off is Minority Report, Philip K. Dick. Man in, the ca- Man in the High Castle, Philip K. Dick. And what you have is, in Minority Report, there is no son, Sean, who's murdered, that causes Tom Cruise's character in the film version to be uh, sought in a manhunt to go away in stasis. There is no rank of captain for Tom Cruise. So Spielberg was writing or using Philip K. Dick novels about pre-crime. And what he's doing is he's making pre-crime. He puts my dad's rank, which is Captain John. Anderton is the thing that Philip K. Dick had, but not the rank. He has the storyline where Sean is murdered and causes, that's why Tom Cruise is going to commit pre-crime. 
there is no Sean being murdered in Philip K. Dick's Minority Report. But there is a Sean murdered in my real life. My son Sean is killed, and Spielberg's laying it out as a pre crime, I'm told, in Minority Report, bastardizing Philip K. Dick's work that he did not want changed. That's just some of the games they play. Now, uh, just to get the facts straight, this is a uh, 300. You filed a lawsuit against Warner Brothers, Joel Silver, and the directors and producers of the Matrix movie or Matrix trilogy. And uh, what was that filed in 2013? Was it January 2013 when it was filed? First filed? It should have been filed in 2009 when I discovered. And what they did was they provided their own attorney, Tony Rankin. Tony Rankin um, was not eligible to practice law in California. And so what you have is, I'm looking for the papers right now, so we can hold this up. Um, you have Tony Rankin, we'll have to find it in a second, but Tony Rankin has a suspended license since 1990. So you have him in 2009 appearing, landlord to the wife that I married. He appears, says he's going to put in $100,000 and take care of this and, and win me my rights. He delayed for three years to make sure the statutes ran out. The day the statutes ran out on your three-year discovery, he went on vacation. He appears and says, oh, I guess we lost. So he ran the clock out, didn't tell us he had a suspended license, and it goes on from there. So in actuality, I actually didn't file the case. He filed it in my name. He was supposed to file as my attorney. Instead, he forged my name on the documents and filed me pro per on that day when it's too late and statutes have run. It gets worse from there. So when you say, you know, when people say, you know, he lost his case, that case was a sham. That was a break Morant all the way through where they controlled the whole game field and ran the clock out for three years getting all my discovery. And then we find they have no working drafts. They have no evidence. But anyway, I can talk later about how they actually throw it. Yeah, I, uh, what I want to do is just, you know, set the facts so, straight so people yeah. understand. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. Okay. So again, you have the Immortals. Uh, is something is a screenplay you wrote in 92, submitted to Warner Brothers 93, 99. The Matrix comes out. I believe it was uh, 2003 and four. You have Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions. Then in 2013, you you file this uh, this this uh, I guess it's uh, copyright infringement. Uh, it's a th it's a three hundred million dollar lawsuit, right? You file totally arbitrary. I didn't get to set the figure. I didn't call the shots. I didn't get to talk to the news. I was like completely hogtied. And they actually provided um, firm members from Hollywood, from Warner Brothers, to be his staff, Rankin staff, Tony Rankin of Maui. So it was right there. Was you know everything gunning it down to even making sure no discovery, no recourse in the news. And what's really interesting, Chad, is when it's thrown completely is when we try to fire him. He had a contract he doesn't want ever shown where he's not allowed to be fired. He was pretending to be proper. So when we try to fire him, within half an hour after being so fired, he sends us an email half an hour later saying, I contacted Warner Brothers. Usually you're supposed to have a meeting if there's going to be a motion for summary judgment to discuss the facts. I allowed a phone call to be that meeting and allowed them, to allowed them to proceed to summary judgment without objection. Case is done. All my evidence, all those three years or four years of working on that stuff, out the door. So after he's fired, he makes sure it's thrown and collects by allowing summary judgment without objection. It was, it's a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. So, okay. So the Warner Brothers, of course, denies it, and, and they, the 10 years of statute of limitations passes. So what happens... What happens at that point? What happens as after? soon as the case is thrown? There's a whole bunch of things that happen rapidly. The case is thrown. Joel Silver announces Oblivion. Disney's holding on to that for him. So basically, they steal the work, railroad you, and then steal immediately. All the defendants had their own takes on the work. Warner Brothers does Elysium through Bloomkopf, and Wachowski's announced Sense Eight in the same week that the case is thrown saying it's too big to write down. So they didn't even write a word down. They simply take off our script, all my notes, everything else. <clears throat> so they steal again with impunity. 
is, is what they do as soon as the case was thrown. It was an absolute nightmare. My daughter was approached by a relative of the firm that was throwing the case and ends up estranging me and marrying him. It's, it's incredible. It's all handling. I find out my wife, Becca Northcutt, on my birthday, leaves my son and goes to Mike Lang at Disney on my birthday. And we have the emails where he's showing his bed with a shaving kit, property in Spokane, Washington, the historic property, Mike Lang of Southern California, and saying, move in with me for 60 days, Becca. They said it was because of ego. That's what I was told. So he's sleeping with the author's wife to rub it in his face. Unbelievable how far they go flexing their power. So it sounds like a movie. Yeah, it does. And I was going to ask you about that too. Um, there was this something in 2020. Uh, what was this matrix? There was a movie that um, I'm not sure if, if you had any part of it. Do you know what I'm talking about? 2020. Are you talking about matrix four? Uh, it's no. called the Matrix. Well, the, 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 okay. I think it was, uh, was it called the Matrix Redeemed? I'm not talking about the one that came out last year. I'm talking about the. There's something in IMDb, um, IMDb that says the Matrix Redeemed 2020 real life story of a writer's struggle with Hollywood. That's really bizarre. That would be probably the Spielberg plant. Um, he went by the name Abercrombie or something. His name was actually Peter out of New York that worked with Spielberg. And he wanted to sign a contract with me. They do contracts to try to get you roped in. I wouldn't sign it. So he went ahead and said that I had relayed my work over to him and he was going to make this movie that Spielberg could control. And it was like, that's the game they play. So they hit you every which way that, you know, that would be that. It wasn't even a movie. I don't think they even shot anything. Yeah, but I mean, he's I, supposed I, to be paid. If you look on uh, imdb.com, which is uh, it's a website that talks a lot about celebrities and, and actors, mm -hmm. uh, it says The Matrix Redeemed. The original title is The Immortals Redeemed, 2020, oh real life story of a writer's struggle with Hollywood. Oh the, immor the immortal screenplay is pitched and the studio proceeds to steal and distort it. They release his work as The Matrix. <laughs> I, don't, I, I just don't know what it's about. I saw it and I, I thought maybe you knew no, well i know who's doing that it's spielberg's guy see they like to play good guy up and play both sides and so this was a guy that was supposedly going to help me and then we find out that he was working for quote the great steven spielberg who was in this from the beginning so it was just as soon as i launched the pitch session with bonaventura it has been a nightmare it has been an absolute nightmare and my crime they say is that i dared to face them down dared to face them down so Thank God I have all the documentations. And so, so you, you have a lawsuit against them now going on? No, I'm not touching the courts right now. What I'm doing is the court of public opinion. So we're doing the documentary and we're making a library of evidence that'll be available to the entire world so everybody can access it. We're going to do it that way. If we go to the courts, they control the courts. Right now in this country, you do not win a lawsuit on copyright. After what I've seen, they'll switch judges out. They'll put whoever they want. They did with the Avatar group, too. And they'll destroy your life, quote, destroy. So don't touch the courts. If you have a copyright situation, do not go in the courts. What you need to do is show your evidence, protect your evidence, because they'll use that process with game and ship to destroy your evidence. And I have a lot of cases with that, too. So I'm trying to warn people that there is no justice. Some people say, well, why don't you win your case? I never even had a case. The case was their case. They supplied the people on both sides. It was good cop, bad cop on both sides. And I had no rights in the hole. And they just joked. They said, I really got the shaft. I really got screwed. So they brag about it. Mm. Tom, uh, you're, you're getting a little dark. Is there any chance you oh, could uh, open up some light? light yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that looks, that okay. looks a bit better. I'll Thank see you. if I can pump it too. Okay. But yeah, it's, it, uh, I can tell you, besides the death of the sons, it's just they went all out. And then they blame you for it. They blame um, the victim. They blame the victim for what happens because they say that you dared to face them. And well, for, for those people who don't know uh, about those deaths in your family, can you just quickly go into it? 
Sure. Um, let me see if I get a picture of Sean Kirk. No, here's, here we are. Okay. Here is my son. They have the audacity to say they never existed, which is amazing. This is actually the article on Sean. This is hard for me. Yeah, let me put no, you it. let me put you on full screen here. So. Okay, so October 14th, 1982, right? He's killed on the eyes of March when Caesar's murdered. He's murdered. I'm told he's murdered. So they murdered him with a snow plow in his car. It was like dented and he's killed. October 14th, 1982 is what the date is in The Good Place. If you look at The Good Place, just like Spielberg's Minority Report saying Sean's going to be killed in 2002, they put October 14, 1982 as the exact birthday as lead character who's talking to Sean Michael. Sean Michael was born October 14, 1982. This is how they rub it in your face. This is Kirk, my other son. Kirk was killed at the bottom of a lap pool, a lap pool in Japan at a military base. He was killed a messianic death, which is you die in the shallows, a traitor's death. He had warned me what was going on, and uh, he was killed after. But how? How, 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 did, how did he drown? Or what happened? He was drowned. He was an expert swimmer, diver. He was work, He was doing a lapse. The lifeguard, they claim, just left and said, he'll be fine. Lifeguards never leave their station, especially the military base. Where's the camera footage? Where's all that? It's like 9-11. What happens is he's, le- what, he's, he's murdered, I'm told, in a lap pool. And you can't die in a lap pool if lifeguards are on duty on a military base. It's not going to happen. So Stars and Stripes actually does a stupid move. They say they're going to do an investigation in their article and for Kirk Althaus. And what they say is he was revived. Sure. I'm, I was lifeguard too. Yeah. Youth usually are revived. Then they, they don't give any cause of death. And he's cremated. Both Sean and Kirk were cremated. I never got to see the bodies. So it's in my screenplay, in my screenplay prior to all this, um, this one here, The Immortals, you have the one character that's really important is cremated and the body's never seen after that. So it's like, that's exactly what happens. I didn't want my boys cremated. Wow. I would like to say goodbye. Mm. You still have a, a daughter. I don't now. My daughter is totally with the other side. She despises her dad. That was a PR nightmare for them, should it have been worked the other way. I always loved her, always treated her well. Terrace um, is the little girl of the Matrix. She's, I was modeling uh, her as that little girl. And it's in here, the exact ending. The Wachowskis actually say they keep the exact ending. They want to keep the exact ending when everyone else said blow up on the set, blow up the Matrix. They keep my exact ending with the little girl pointing the sun, the, um, the train station scene, the... Um, uh, pulse wave coming out with identical figures facing off and earth turning green and the skies it's all there mm. so they kept the exact ending so we will have justice in the future we will but first we have the documentary everything else because right now you cannot beat them no one can beat them unless you're part of their family and it's an in-house fight but the fbi allows these things to happen they actually profit off it if you figure like this first graphic this is actually like this upside down i don't know if i showed you this but this first graphic is the first it's upside, it's upside down now that's what they did they they made it upside down for a split second if you see the corner up here it's the pages are turning that's mm. a, that's the only that's a still shot you get with the page turning it, and that's digital and what you have on there is that shot like that their graphic designer says Anytime they are sticking something in for a split second, it's for the uh, director's eyes only to keep the project interesting for them. In that, we've discovered even more. Like you asked about the matchups and everything. We found my birthday, my dad's name, my high school, Central West. Here's the, um, uh, where is it? Here's my diploma. So you have Central West, Central West West. We call it Central West. My high school is Neo School central west and you also have my dad's name john a you have my name thomas a you have my birthday you have my fiance's birthday otika bernard march 11th as neo's birthday why, why would they do that why would they to mock. they never thought i'd see it it's in for a split second chat it's a fair question but it's in for a split second 
So how am I ever going to know? I'm the only one that would be able to identify it. But if I, not for somebody in the story department contacting me, a gentleman contacting me and saying this is all in there, I would never have known. Do you think it, uh, them mocking you like that is similar to how in society we have all of this numerology and symbolism that's laid out? If you want to look at it, it's right there in front of you. Is it? Yes. Well, that's brilliant. You just said that because that's exactly what's there. Look at, look at the column. I mean, we got my high school, my birthday, my fiance's birthday at the time, who was at the pitch session with Bonaventura, my dad's name, uh, my marital status, the capital city, and you've got this, TA4099. TA was 40 and 99. I was 40 and 99. Tom Malthouse was 40 and 99. Then you have 380, which is numerology, like you said, numerology. Look up 380 in numerology. It's something like to... Uh, take your most cherished worldly possessions to help you prepare for your death. And that was the joke the Wachowskis were coming up with, I'm told, from the inside, to prepare T.A., who was 40 and 99. So you consider that, you know, they do that because they never thought I'd see it. They probably thought I'd be dead by then. I was supposed to be out and killed. And then in Animatrix, you have 7, 2, 59, my exact birthday on the clock in Animatrix, exact birthday my age four past the 444 in 2003 you cannot change a hand on that and that's a still shot from animatrix so they were mocking and mocking all the way apparently i'm told they thought i'd be dead so no one would ever know and they'd feel more clever than the author they actually mocked the worth on set the immortals title they just rearranged the letters and come up with matrix they rearranged it immortals becomes matrix so and add an x yeah uh, do you, are you are you ever planning on going back into the court system, or are you completely done with it at this point? I am sick of the American injustice system and how attorneys are allowed to provide themselves, solicit, block any discovery whatsoever. We have a tape of Warner Brothers saying to the attorney they own, their classmate, they said, their attorneys that were supposed to represent me and them, saying to each other, well, what about those discovery issues? What about initial disclosures? Discovery, you're supposed to have discovery. Otherwise, the case of the fraud, if it's not having happening. So what about discovery? On that tape, you hear them say, it's a moot point to ask for any discovery because we don't have any. We don't have any working drafts or anything. None exists. So they shot the matrix without working drafts. You think I'd win that case with all the matchups and all the inserts? So I'm told by uh, the fight choreographer, this is used on set in one hand as they make it up as they go along, ripping things out of context, and a storyboard of the images in the other hand. And that's why you had a 20-foot rule where you're not allowed within 20 feet. This is a slam dunk outside of the courts because in the courts, they own it. They own it. But outside the courts, it's a slam dunk. Now, they're counting on audiences to be dumb. They're counting on them to go, he lost his case, nothing else to see. Like that idiosyncrasy movie where they go, it has electrolytes, it has electrolytes. They don't expect people to use critical thinking. So far, they've been pretty right about that. But when you look at everything that's there, yes, in the future, and that's what I'm looking at. For my son and their children, his children after them, there will be justice. For me, probably not. There'll be a documentary, it'll come out, and I'm happy with that. I'm fine. As long as my the last surviving son has a life and sees the return of this and has the honor then that's good with me. That's good with me. And that's what I'm fighting for. So I'm off their playbook. They're actually saying I've won the chess game because I'm not following their rules. And that's by doing interviews, which you're gracious enough to do here. And by doing a documentary and making that library of evidence, people will see it. In the future, you're going to have algorithms that are going to be able to look at all stuff in all sources and draw conclusions. Watch the conclusions. Even though they struck websites and struck evidence and things like this, with a library of evidence, you watch the conclusions in the future, whether this author wrote it or the Wachowskis wrote it. They said they failed as writers in 95. They'd have to pack their bags and leave Hollywood unless they were given the science project. They were given the science project. Yeah, you, uh, there's a couple of questions I have, but the first one is you talk about this documentary. Who's producing it? When is it coming out? And what is it about? The team's in Arizona. What we're doing is we're going to focus strictly on um, the matchups. We're going to make it easy, easy to digest for the public because we've got an education about the public in general, except for the really few smart people. 
And that's how we see it now. It's very disappointing. But the matchups will be shown. That's, a, that's up, actually up to 190 plus. Squiddies, Jack the Neck, Little Girl Train Station, all that. The inserted material, biographical insert material, where they stack it in there. Susanna Bolger, their graphic designer, says he stacks it in. High school, all that. That's going to be in. And how the case was thrown. When the people see that, it won't be overwhelming, but it'll be very, very clear. We're actually going to get a mathematician, an expert mathematician, we're working on to do the probabilities of having your high school as, when there's copyright law about having that happen, in the first graphic, along with your father's name, along with your name, along with your fiance's birthday, along with your birthday, along with your um, uh, TA, uh, TA 4099 in the column. <laughs> Come on. Come on. So, right, they've been, they've been blown away by the mathematical probability right there. It's just like, it doesn't exist. It's so off the charts. You well, know, anybody, why, do you, yeah. why do you think they didn't include you? Maybe they would have seen the, I'm, I'm sure, they, of course, they saw the immortals, and maybe they would have said, you know, there's a lot in here that we can use for the Matrix, and why, why, not, just, why not just give you a, a bone? And, and give you credit or give you some some something towards it, you know, uh, and, and then not not have to deal with all this. They make more money by ripping off the author, actually. It's big. It's more sensible to steal from the author and have them go through the court process where you control the court process. And then you get to steal again all his work. You get his notes and everything else. It's like getting the black book of the writer, like an elf. Remember, they get the little guy's book and say, oh, we got his book. That's what they do. They get all your notes, your drafts, everything. That's why the defendant stole immediately as soon as the case was thrown with impunity. And it's like Joel Silver then did Alder Carbon. Joel Silver does Alder Carbon after a car runs me down and then kills my son. He does Alder Carbon. And he's calling it, they're calling it on Netflix the greatest sci fi concept ever, which is the rich in the future have immortality, the poor is used as pawns, which is exactly what the story treatment says. So now he's claiming even that. And there's nothing I can do with that except educate the public but i'll tell you what i i got tested um with a psych person and i said just check me out just check and see you know what you can find because i need to be able to pre present who i am and they said gifted genius and this kind of stuff and tremendous empathy and that kind of stuff and they said you're in the top one percent of the world that scared me because i don't for, feel that for what for um intelligence um um What's that I, called? Your IQ. IQ. Yeah. So I scored in the top 1%, they said, and it's like, that scares me. We are way backwards as humanity, as, as a species. We are so far behind because I should be at the bottom rung of intelligence, I feel like. What do you mean? mean what, do you, wait, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Because the reason I wrote the piece, you know, the Neuralink, Jack's the Neck, Neuralink, and everything that's in here. The reason I have Neuralink created and all the ramifications that are good and bad, it's there to propel the story, is because I was frustrated about how our mind works, that we can't handle a lot of layers and we, our memory doesn't hold to a lot of things and gets distracted so easy. So that's why the neural link was invented, the idea of the neural link, which they gave to Elon Musk. The thing is that <clears throat> because I was frustrated as a writer that we can't remember things as we should, and that's why your agents just look and know things right away with the jack to the neck. The, I called it the enhancer. So the neural link was called the enhancer, brain enhancer. So it's just descriptive what it is. And that was out of that frustration as a writer. So, and, you know, a lot of the things in the matrix or the immortals is out of my frustration with humanity. That's why, you know, now we have the panel where you put your hand up and you can do transactions through your hand on the panel. That's in the Immortals back in 92. And um, uh, Surrey. Surrey's in there in 92 because the main character loses his wife. They took that relationship out and unraveled the story. It doesn't make sense. You can't just stick Trinity in there. And the reason they call her Trinity is because there's three love interests to the main character, including his wife. And so they just call her Trinity. It's just mockery, mockery, mockery. It's all through. So when people actually see what's really there, and we bring it forward to the public without attorneys screwing around and judges being bought. When you actually see what's there, you'll get to know, like Shakespeare in Love, where everything came from, why it's there, um, how it propels the story, and how the story ties together into one screenplay, two hours long. And so, 
That will be interesting, I think. Now, they're saying nobody's going to watch it because they used up the story. They're saying they used up the story. Their attorneys actually told me, you sat on it. We produced it. They used that argument at my deposition that they produced it and made something of it, so therefore I just shouldn't say anything. It's a copyright thing, I thought. But they're claiming that they did it. They did a good thing. They made it. And they even have in the deposition, they even say, it's on the transcript, given the fact that you wrote The Matrix, uh, strike that. It's that bad, Chad. It's that bad. So, uh, well, there, there's a couple of questions I want to ask, but uh, some some people who are watching this interview are probably familiar with a woman named Sophia Stewart, who also yeah. claims to have written the Matrix. What's that about? Does she have any basis to have written the Matrix, or is that another uh, person that the studio put in there to kind of throw off the trail? Well, here's the interesting thing: the documentary term team turned up a letter, and thank God Sophia Stewart posted it. She did it out of ego. Her company, first of all, Chad, is called All Eyes on Me. All Eyes on Me, writer, producer, director. That's the ego. Yet she calls me all the time. Egomaniac says I'm responsible for the death of my sons. I'm going to call. Sophia Stewart was put to be a first claimant out of the projects, out of USC, by Warner Brothers. Joel Silver took his director out of, War out of USC also. They get the same stomping ground, same alumni they use to do Alter Carbon. What you have is Sophia Stewart's put in place so the uh, audiences will, like, just like they're using up the rest of the story they claim, they want to use up the rest of the story, Joel Silver's own quote, so no one will watch what I have later. They want to also use up the value of the claimant. So by having the first claimant, no one's supposed to pay attention to the second guy coming along, the poor schmuck that comes along, they said. That's how they play. And that's what they did. Now, Sophia Stewart contacted me immediately as soon as they brought it forward to me about the matching scenes I told you about. The wife did that under the attorney. Sophia Stewart contacted me. She said, you're the missing link. You need to claim Matrix 2 and 3. I'm Matrix 1. Together, we'll bring the house down. The reason she said that was because that's what Warner Brothers wanted. If you don't claim Matrix 1, now she, you know, she, now she mocks it. If you don't claim Matrix 1, they argued that if you're not claiming Matrix 1, then any matchups in Matrix 1 don't count for 2 and 3. Therefore, no matchups. When there's 190... It doesn't make any sense, but that's what the attorney that he provided did not allow me to claim Matrix 1. I kept doing it, wanting it, calling it. So they make it look like you're pro per, but they control everything going on. And that's another way they were able to throw it. There's so many ways they threw it. It's, it that's what's going to be so interesting about bringing forward how the case was thrown. And I think smart people will get it. Mm. So this goes on all the time, even till today, where people so consider harassed. it. Yeah. What what is the what is the process for submitting a screenplay? Well, you shouldn't do it, but you have to go to the copyright office, you know, and uh, in Washington D.C. or submit to it. That is a big no no. If you do that, they have insiders at the copyright office. How do I know that? Because the entries that they put in with the immortals are no body of work. There's no no pages, just titles. They have the Immortals under Dean Laurentiis, who winded on the Wachowskis, was on with Assassins with Paradise Films, under Immortals. But no body of work, just titles, subtitles, Army of Darkness. And what's interesting is they put that in to the copyright office, my very title. And then what they do is anybody who submits the work to the copyright office, they get to see it and they get to steal from it. And they'll make sure that they don't get their rights. So the Copyright Office really just establishes who created it first. It, it's, it's a total sham. And what they did was they put um, uh, my title, finally, after, after I went to Hollywood. Dean Laurentiis takes his name off it, Paradise Films, Dean Laurentiis Films, all off of it. And he puts, they put on uh, the two biggest investment firms basically in the world, a Netherlands Bank, and this other one, and that becomes the ones that are claiming they created the material. So investment firms are claiming, claiming they created the immortals. There's also entries in the copyright office that Tom Hanks is being commissioned by Warner Brothers to write the immortals. It also says Wendy Wasserstein, in a separate entry, is commissioned by Warner Brothers to write the immortals. The Wachowskis weren't the first choice. They were actually picking Tom Hanks, I'm told, because it would look not like a novelty that an actor suddenly got the writing bug. And it would make sense to the public they would go for that. And I would be shut out. Then they felt that um, Wendy Wasserstein, the writer of the Heidi Chronicles, successful Broadway playwright, 
um, not a screenwriter, but a playwright, that they could give it to her. A Jewish woman who was successful at Broadway would be a great claimant. But Joel Silver was battling for the Wachowskis to have it because Wachowskis failed at Assassins. I'll make this short. I'll shorten this up. They failed at Assassins, so they had to bring another writer in. That's where they wanted out of Warner Brothers. They went all the way to the Writers Guild. Out of Warner Brothers, they want to author credits off the name of Assassins. Instead, Joel Silver makes a deal. Listen, I'll give you an audition piece called Bound. They put my grandmother's name, Violet, as the main character for Larry. They always stick my family names in. So what they did was they, um, uh, they directed Bound. Then they were given the science project after that. So Joel Silver held on to the Immortals, gave it to the Wachowskis, and went around Tom Hanks and Wendy Wasserstein with the suits by saying, look, they directed Bound. That's how the Wachowskis got a hold of it. Mm. And it's a, it's a traumatic event. You told about my sons, you know, dying and my daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, there was another trauma that happened where, um, the woman that I was, um, engaged to be married to, Otika Lynn Ball, Otika Lynn Bernard now, um, who they put her birthday as Nina's birthday. When she left, she was enticed away and that destroyed me. That's when the Wachowskis were given the work, 95, 96. When I lost Otika, that's when the, the writer's broken. What they year gave, was what year was that? Ninety five, at the end of ninety five, beginning of ninety six. Okay, and that's when they give the work to Wachowski's when the writer's broken. So they beat you down, destroy you, entice people away. And uh, in fact, my sister now is in the pocket of this congressman who's actually a lifelong FBI and a congressman, Ways and Means Committee involved with Ukraine. Everything is the one that keeps giving her rewards, including congressional records on the floor of Congress holding her picture up. It's amazing how far they go to reward people. And it's supposed to make you sound crazy. But when you live this and you see it, thank God as a writer and a scholar, I've got all the evidence. I got everything here. So the library evidence is a way to go. Not to fumble around with the courts. Lay it out for the public to see it and lay it out in a documentary that makes it clear. So we're focusing back to the other question. Matchups inserted biomaterial which is incredible how much they've done how the case was thrown they don't want that revealed and that's also going to play the tape audibly of their attorney saying uh, it's a moot point to ask for discovery which is fraud we should have the case again um or have actual case um because we have no, they said we have no working drafts no working drafts what's when did you change your mind about the court system well, my son lost his faith. My last surviving son was at when they were throwing it, and he said he believed in God. And then when he saw what they did to us in the courts and how bastard was the judge, then he just said, "I." When was that? That was in the um the they orchestrated a malpractice case where they they controlled all the strings on it, and that was that was in 2016. 2016, when my sister is pocketed by the congressman, lifelong FBI guy from California. And that's also when uh, Becca Northcutt, my wife, is taken by Mike Lang back. And that's also when they started these uh, 302 attempts to put me away under um, uh, dangerous and crazy with a gun, they are saying, which Pat Robertson had started that one. So uh, ever since then, I've been faced with SWAT teams hauling me off and trying to lock me away for life. And it's is, been. Is, we, we have something here called Baker Act, where if someone's. Is that a three? That's that what you're talking about? A 302? 302 is, yeah. If, you're, if you. I think the prerequisite is you have to be um, totally crazy, totally nuts, which, mm -hmm. I mean, there's shills that will say this all the time. But you have to basically say you're going to shoot somebody or kill somebody and kill yourself. I would never say that. I've done how many interviews have I done? Hundreds of interviews. I've never said that. I never will. But it only takes a bot sister to say, oh, he calls me all the time and says this. He's waving a gun around. What? He's going to shoot me. He's going to shoot me. You know, she's the one acting manic and delusional but and she's not well even though she's rewarded by this fitzpatrick guy she's an elementary school counselor but she gets to say this and she feels great power so she's never going to stop she said they're going to keep instituting this thing where they use her credentials they gave her to say yeah tom's calling me all the time saying he's going to shoot me uh, no no you've had this long-standing rivalry with warner brothers but are all movie studios like that do they all take or do you think it's just a single incident with Warner Brothers? Well, it's kind of like the network news. If you are looking at um, the main studios, they're all intertwined. The main studios are all intertwined, just like your main companies, like six or so companies in the media. Now, mm -hmm. also what's interesting, Chad, is the studio, you may know, the studios also own news agencies. 
uh, Warner Brothers owns CNN. So therefore, if you watch a Warner Brothers affiliated film or Sony, you'll see CNN as the news reporters all the time. Now, Disney owns ABC News. So, you know, that's one of the things they used to reward my daughter. When she was estranged to me, they gave her positions at line producers on ABC news stations because Disney owns them. So Disney and Warner Brothers have done this from the very beginning with Universal. They control all these different studios. And now the norm is to pop up all these different studios on projects. You'll see all these different names. They made a game out of it, basically, from Lionsgate to you name it. And it even gets kind of crazy on the names. But you'll see multiple studios doing this stuff. One of the things they're now doing is anime. They want basically the world. So in anime, Sony is working with Warner Brothers. And um, one of the first things they did was Elysium after The Great Gatsby was bailed out for Sony. Elysium. What do, you, what, do you, what do you mean The Great Gatsby was bailed out? The Great Gatsby was way over budget. And so Sony was begging for help, I was told. And so what happens is Warner Brothers came to the aid of them and they became meshed. The first yeah. work they did was Elysium. That was the so just for people. To, the Great Gatsby was the movie with Tobey Maguire and Leonardo DiCaprio. That's correct. Right, based off the F. F uh, Scott Fitzgerald novel. Great novel. From, from great the novel. Yeah, 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 great novel. And and for those people, Elysium starred Matt Damon, I believe. Right, and what's interesting is he never saw. He didn't see a script. He saw a visual storyboard, and that's the same thing with Inception. Visual storyboard. Uh, Will Smith didn't see a script. He saw a visual storyboard. For what that's, movie? That's how they rip it off. Rip, they rip off work. They make which, a visual storyboard. Which, which movie for Will Smith? He was supposed to be Neo in The Matrix. They approached him to be uh, my, my character. And instead, he turned it down because they didn't have a script. He said, this is ridiculous. All they did was talk about how exciting and they're gonna blow things up and all stuff. They, it was, he said it was nonsense. Hmm. And yeah, Oblivion actually, uh, I would say of, of the last 10 years, it's one of my favorite movies, just the visuals, Tom Cruise, uh, mm -hmm. great movie, Morgan Freeman, if you haven't seen it, and some great sci-fi movies that came out in the last 10 right. years. So yeah. And if you want to see where it comes from too, Chad, it's like the, the pods, the um, stadium, the identical figures facing off, the little girl pointing to her daddy at the end, the um, uh, name of the main characters is Jack and Julie, my two, mm -hmm. my two siblings that are bought off. Joel Silver had a heyday with it. Get this. Oblivion was going to be a novel, and they were going to make the novel first as a plausible source material, but they scrapped the novel after my case was thrown. As soon as my case was thrown, they're not, they said they weren't going to finish the novel. They never did, apparently. They just went right to stealing the work. They didn't need the novel anymore as a plausible source work. So isn't that something? And you can see that in the articles. They scrapped the novel right when the case was thrown. Wait, I want to, I want to get this straight. So, you Oblivion was going to be a novel. Wait, so, so the, your, uh, how, did, how did they rip off your work? From the Immortals, was it? Or? From the Immortals. The Immortals is what they're drawing from. As Joel Silver keeps saying, he doesn't, he doesn't make art, he acquires it. He also says he was hoping to use up the rest of the story. He said that on the set when 2 and 3 and Animatrix were being shot. He said, we hope we used up the rest of the story. And we hope it'll tie together when we watch The Rushes. So what's interesting is... Um, He's constantly trying to use up all the concepts. The reason they had a visual storyboard, they wanted to use up every concept that was unique from the 190 of this work. And so that's why you have Animatrix. Animatrix is ridiculous. What you have is all these shorts that are using the visuals they didn't use when they made it up as they went along on set. And that's why the train station scene has the ghost man, the, man, uh, the train man from Ghost added in because they're making up as they go along. They stick in the ghost train man. And it's like, that just keeps happening where they just stick stuff in, making up as they go along. And some of the things, like, I could talk so long on that, I won't burden you with it, but I want to point one out. I'd like to point one out to you, unless you have another question we go right to. I was just going to say that, you, so you're saying that they, they were able to create some of Oblivion from your script, The Immortals, as well? Oh, absolutely. But the, what, get this. Joe Silver, as a defendant, is seeing all of my work. He knows he's safe. He's seeing all the scripts, working drafts, notes, everything, hearing me testify. So as soon as the case is thrown, don't even worry about finishing the novel. Let's shoot Oblivion. Disney holds on to it for him, only for Joel Silver. So Joel Silver is getting to take his take on the Immortals, the scenes he thinks are cool. He said he loved the battle sequences. He loved the battle sequences. And they all had their favorite things. So Joel Silver is doing the identical figures facing off, the little girl actually pointing. What's interesting, too, is in the original work, it says robot-like agents. Now, 
Joel Silver in an article is quoted as saying to these executives, Warner Brothers suits, when the Wachowskis couldn't explain the work, he's saying, Bob, it's robots in the program, robots in the program. And the guys, the suit guy is saying like, what do you mean robots in a program? Joel Silver got it wrong. It's robot-like agents in the program. So that raises the stakes. So when Oblivion comes out, Joel Silver corrects his mistake. He's seen all my notes and everything else. He puts robot-like agents. So Tom Cruise is a robot-like agent and duplicate. That's where you see these things that are unique to the work coming forward. And the Wachowskis wanted to use a stadium, but it was too expensive. So Joel Silver gets to use a stadium. It's in the original work. The stadium is key in this work where the agents all come together. The room of monitors, everything is there, Chad. So I expect skepticism, but that's why I'm doing this, to present it so that people can't get away from it. It's going to be right there, clear as a bell. I have, I have multiple questions, but uh, uh, Mike, so I don't forget, I just want so I'll, I'll, I'll put out maybe all three and you can address them. One is, um, can you write a novel about Oblivion since technically your work is on it? Would that, is that legally possible? I can write it. I can write a book about immortals and now which Warner Brothers says they're going to put an injunction on me if I make the immortals or if I write anything about the immortals because they say they're going to put an injunction on me for the matchups. Well, then we're back in court. If there, if there's matchups, I've won one single matchup means there's no summary judgment. There's 190. So their threat, they even did it like earlier question. They do it through Sophia Stewart too. Sophia Stewart says it. Warner Brothers attorneys say it. We'll put an injunction on you if you make the immortals. Why, Chad, would there be an injunction on me when there's no copyright in the Matrix? There's a copyright on the immortals, and it precedes the Matrix. There's a 1998 stamp right there. There's a 1998 version. And the reason there's no copyright on the Matrix is because they hadn't decided which title, Wachowskis hadn't decided which one they were going to pick at the time. So they, I mean, they were picked to be having the work, so they couldn't pick their title. They couldn't have their title. What's interesting is the Wachowskis did not take one of the titles that was in the copyright on the Immortals. There was Army of Darkness, subtitle, and 346 other titles. They were so angry about Assassins being finished by another writer that they went outside the box and screwed up the whole copyright fraud plan by picking their own title by reversing the letters around. Now, notice that they reverse the letters around to make Matrix and also stick all my personal information in. They want Warner Brothers to fall, but they want to make all the money they can. That's why they raised Matrix 4 forward before that. But again, they didn't expect me to ever see it. They didn't expect me to live through it. But yeah, I hope that helps. Did you ever make a cent from the Immortal screenplay? Say again? Did you ever make any money from the Immortals? No, in fact, I'm charged. By them controlling both sides of the attorney process, in fact, they had a stipulation order that only attorneys' eyes only on any discovery, because they didn't have working drafts that came out later. They had no working drafts. So they made a rule that judges and jury and me, I, can't see their evidence. Not allowed to see it, because they didn't have any. While they're telling the public they have tons. It's, it's, a, it's a done deal if we have a fair venue. But no, instead they're charging me about $100,000 at 21% interest when I didn't even have a say in the whole process. And it, like I said, Tony Rankin throws the case after he's fired. He throws it right away by allowing them to proceed to summary judgment without objection. It's over. If you don't have objection, they want. That's the only way you can really win an MSJ motion for summary judgment is no evidence presented. I'm sitting here busting at the seams with evidence, matchups all over the wazoo. Won't let me put it in. Because he's, he gets fired, he finishes the job. He was quoted a couple times as saying, and I have this on tape, he's saying a couple times, I just want to give them everything they want and be done with it. That's how he was, yeah, great attorney. I couldn't fire him. I tried to fire him. Yeah, a nightmare. So they had a handoff firm finish it, Rios and Associates. And that's the guy that ends up marrying the daughter. Rios, Ralph Rios and Associates from Pasadena has Jacob Rios marry the daughter so she'll ever, forever be estranged. It's, it's unbelievable how they play ball. Same time, Joel Silver's getting oblivion. Uh, so you didn't make a, a red cent from the Immortals? It's nothing. I didn't make anything. I lost money. Right. I, I was going to ask you, how much did, did it cost you since you went ahead and, and filed litigation? And, and the whole time that you've done it up till now, how much do you think it has cost you? Well, again, let's make it clear. I didn't file litigation. They did. They filed for me. 
it, you would say. They already they had thrown it. They had thrown the case. They had thrown it. So they filed it and and get this too. They actually stipulated that I could serve the defendants after they ran the clock out on serving them. So it's like they stipulated also to renew Rankin's license. Warner Brothers attorneys renewed the planted attorney's license so they could proceed to have all my evidence and make sure I'd have no say. It's unbelievable, Chad. It's a, it's a heartbreak. It is just terrible. It's destroyed me. But the thing is that, you know, that's why I don't have a, a very much patience with those that say, he lost his case. It's like, get a brain, look at what's going look what happened there. Please have a little bit of sense and compassion to see what's there. You know, it's like, don't people just say, lost the case. Right. So you right. feel, you feel in your mind, you, you look, it's, it's overwhelming. The evidence is there, but it, you just the can't win it. You can't win a case in the court system. Against, yeah. No, it, look at, look at judge Tro. Judge Tro handled Larry's divorce. He was going to handle this malpractice thing. And along comes when, when they, when they didn't succeed at a summary judgment on malpractice, Trudeau or Tro resigns from position and they bring in their Doyle guy. Who's the one that handles child trafficking. They brought him in to handle my case and he didn't allow anything. I was allowed alter, alternative dispute resolutions. I, that was court ordered. I wasn't allowed to have any discovery whatsoever. They were allowed to do whatever they wanted. I was allowed to have a word. I was not even get an attorney. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, they handle it. They manhandle you all the way through. And that's why my son was affected the way he was. It's, it, I don't know if you can see it on me, but I have been destroyed over what they did. And, um, you know, and then they send these people at you that will just mock and mock. In fact, they mocked me in TMZ and Hollywood Reporter, but TMZ is owned by Warner Brothers. If you call TMZ, you'll hear Warner Brothers. And their attorney, Linda Burrow, who's classmates with Rankin, the one that was to throw the case, she is their attorney, TMZ's attorney. So they run the Wachowskis mocking me in there. Don't allow me to feel any calls from me as I'm calling in uh, for to make statements and then say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't respond. It just it control everything. Mm. And they slandered me saying like, no, nothing hack famous for nothing worldwide. That's how they broke their news. Rankin, the spot attorney doesn't allow me to do anything to, to address that slander. I mean, that's celebrity slandering you and you can't do anything about it. That's the game they play, Chad. It's, it's exhausting. I wouldn't want anybody to go through what my son and I fe faced. So what are you doing now? What do you, what does your life look like now? Are you, are you working? Where do you live? Good question. Any job I get, they're approached with what they call information meetings. And they're told that I'm a dangerous person, dangerous and crazy. Anybody who dates me is approached and called by what they call anonymouses. Don't hang with him. He's dangerous. He'll kill you. It's like they know how to work this. So what we have is the FBI actually is helping the studios and they profit off of that. And our country is just so backwards right now where intellectual property is the big golden gold rush. It's like you make so much money off of an individual's intellectual property. And even if, say, you won in court, they still made a profit off of it. On the proceeds, they made a profit. If they settle with you for a couple million, they made a profit. You had a very good question about why didn't they just throw me a bone? Because of what I had in there. In the original work, Chad, and I'm glad you posed the question, Jim Reese, Neo, is the head of a lower echelon CIA department, also FBI. So you have the bad guys, central, central, the agents are central, which becomes the one world agency or one world body agency. Central is the CIA. So the Smith agents are, you could say, CIA, former CIA. They didn't like that. Also with Pat Robertson, he was revealing all kinds of things that were corrupt in the dealings between Disney, Robertson, FBI. So they had to cleanse it. They did not want that going forward. And what they feared most beyond the money is influence. They didn't want the writer having influence. If I'm the writer of the matrix, I have influence. And they don't want that. They don't want that. Yeah. They want their agenda. So that's why they bring in D players, failed writers. In fact, the Wachowskis were brought in after they claimed they failed at everything. They have Plastic Man and Carnivore. They still haven't gotten to make that. They have that article in 95 where they say they failed as writers and they have to leave, pack and leave, unless they were given something direct. Well, what happened? 
And why are they saying they have plastic man and carnivore, but hope to be given hope to be given the science project in ninety five? And as soon as they're given my work after Atik is gone, they're given my work. They said they went out and bought their mansion. It's so evident and so clear. But they're putting me away on three hundred twos because they're saying he thinks he wrote the Matrix. Chad, here's the copyright. So Sophia Stewart and the rest of them are saying that's a forgery. How's that a forgery? Does that look like a forgery? You know. Can, and it's like, can, so if somebody wants to verify that, how do they verify it? Copyright office. Okay. This is there at the copyright office. So this is all 128 pages. Now, Tony Rankin slipped up. He had said that when I go to the copyright office, I'll find eight pages of scribbled notes. He screwed up. So I jumped on it and got this. Now, after I got it, I tried to get another copy. Copyright office wouldn't give it to me. They wouldn't give me another copy. They would not give it to me. I paid for it. When they said, yes, you paid for it and everything, but we're not going to give it to you. It was insane because they had been contacted to Warner Bros. by that point and Disney. So then I found a lady, and that's the lady right here, one of the heroes. It's nice to have some heroes in the story. I love her name. Angela Hightower. It sounds like Lord of the Rings. So Angela Hightower is the lady who actually came to my aid, went around the system, and made this happen within like two weeks when it was just being blocked for years. So she got me the pristine copy. So that's what happens. There's all kinds of heroes in this also that are going to be part of that documentary too. And that's what I'm hoping humanity will catch on to that. You know, we help each other. We don't right now. It seems like a lot of people suffering is entertainment to a lot of people and they get to comment and things like this. But when you lose your sons, you know, when they're murdered, you're told they're murdered. And you're told that your last son, the cars are pulling up in front of your house, like that lady from the shootings in Texas, school shootings, the police were having the cars pull up to try to harass her. And she had to have her kids go elsewhere. She's the one that pulled her kids out of the school. And, um, you know, with the gunman. And so what you have is they said that, yeah, these guys are pulling up in front of your home because they, they, want, they know you're concerned for your last son's safety. They're showing they can get to your son anytime they want. That's the game they're playing, Chad. So when people ask, well, why don't you just do a court case and win? Try it. Walk in my shoes. Try where your two sons are murdered and you're told they're murdered. Try where you don't get even see their bodies to even grieve. Try where your intellectual property that has the copyright and proceeds theirs and they don't have a copyright and they're drooling idiots that failed at everything they did, quote, are getting away with claiming they created it and they made a sham of it in Matrix 4. I didn't watch it. I can't watch it. But they just... Slammed everything that I told just to slam the author. I mean, my high school, my birthday, my dad's name, my name, my fiance's birthday, all that in the first graphic. I say, come on, people. Come on. But why they say, well, this is case. Go ahead, Chad. Why couldn't you watch Matrix 4? I can't watch idiots, their work, that stole my work, got away with it, bragged about it, have mocked, and have also have implications of the murder. I cannot watch their blather and garbage. I knew it would be terrible. What I want to do is get this work made, the original mortals. And that's what the Warner Brothers and the rest of them, Disney, are afraid of, including the FBI. They're afraid that we're going to make the movie the way it originally is. That's why they keep saying, they're trying to dissuade, saying no one's going to watch it. You know, And that's why Joel Silver said, we hope we used up the rest of the story. That's what um, Sophia Stewart calls with. She says, no one's going to watch your movie. It's already been done. So the ones that steal and brag about it are saying no one's going to watch it because it has everything in it. Uh, yeah, well, that would be a cause to make it too, to show that, yeah, it was our work first. Did you ever think about writing a book about this? Yes. In fact, I did start that. I have been writing a book. It's a great, great question, Chad. Yeah. Is it more about, is it from an autobiogra- autobiographical, autobiographical perspective, from a first-person perspective, or is it more of like a, a third-person perspective, the book? Is it your, it's your probably more for a third person. It's like a, when I wrote The Immortals, I was whispering through art, I say, whispering through art. Yeah. I see all the stuff going on, Pat Roberts' organization, how there was a sex ring with Disney, everything else. That's why the train station scene has much more to it than what the Wachowskis say. Wachowskis say it's just a subplot, little girl. No. The train station scene is echoing about tra- child trafficking and everything else. So there's a lot of import to the scenes they stripped out when they just lifted them and hodgepodge them and pasted them together. And that's why they had to keep the exact same ending they said when everybody else said blow it up because they didn't know how to end it. So they kept my exact same ending, which Joel Silver used in Oblivion, the exact ending. So what you have is if it's done 
like I was writing the immortals to whisper through art that in future generations, they understand what's going on with this one world society forming. And that's back in what, 80, 90, 92. So now third person seems to be the right way to go, you know, because unlike Spielberg, I don't like to be self-serving. I don't like to make it, you know, boo hoo, get the tissues out. Here's Tom's sad story. No, I'd rather have a good story where it wakes, it is useful to people as a tool, educational merit. So that's what I'm hoping to do is, is um, show some courage and uh, push the tissue box away and give people something they can hold on to that will prevent them and their children from going through what I went through. I see. So, and are you going to have any ties with Hollywood? Are you going to try to submit any more screenplays or do anything in There's relation been, to? It's a great question. There's been a lot of contacts that have said, or, no, no, maybe pretty frequent in the Hollywood field, which is like three or four times saying script doctor, script doctor, be a script doctor. You'll be the wealthiest guy in Hollywood, be a script doctor. So they've been asking me to be a script doctor to teach others because they're the ones that say, even in Warner Brothers, we know you wrote the work. Like they said, the deposition, given the fact you wrote the matrix. So they know I wrote it. So they want to employ me to teach their, their writers, but they don't want me to have name credit for anything they said, but I'd be very, very wealthy. So, and they would provide you a woman. The Wachowskis, when they were, yeah, when the Wachowskis were approached, Wine and Dine by Dino Laurentiis, he, they were told they'd have beautiful starlets besides fame and riches. Isn't that something? So that's what they, that's their pitch. So that's how they do it with all of us. You know, it's like, yeah. And they do it like you're casting a show. Casting a show. Yeah. Rebecca Northcutt, when she came along, looked exactly like my ideal. But she had to be changed into that. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Well, why not take them up on their offer, go out there, be wealthy, have a woman, live the Hollywood life? I would be stealing other people's work. I'd be helping to steal those people. I'd be using my genius to steal other people's work. And I could not live with myself, mm. especially if they have kids. I saw what my kid went through. I won't do it. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to ask. Well, uh, Tom, I thank you very much for thank being on. Much. We had this hour long uh, podcast and uh, it's great having you back on. And I Thank hope you. that I hope that for the people that watch the first two shows or, or who've never seen you before, I hope it's all clear. Uh, Tom, tell people where they could find you if they want to see you and your work. Well, that's part of the strategy that goes on. They struck my website. So now we're putting a website up and we're going with a domain, um, the Neo project blue because the blue pill is actually the good pill. The red pill is bad. They switched it around when they took the work. The red pill is based on the blood of the children for a mortal program. The blue pill was the underground's pill. It wasn't offered equally by Morpheus. Only the red pill was offered by Smith. The blue pill was offered by Morpheus later in the original work. Blue pill was good, the underground pill. So we're allowing people to see that. And they're, the other side's afraid of that. They're catching on. So there is no website right now. I'm on Facebook. I have an email. I can't always respond, but I'm on uh, Instagram. I have an email, which is 77. And this comes from Hollywood because they always said you're the, the Truman shows around you, Tom, the Truman shows about you. So I don't know if that's a fact they claim maybe they're just joking, but so I used it as a joke, seven 77, the true man show. So it's spelled out true man show 77, the true man show play on words at gmail.com. They can reach me that way if somebody wants to. And uh, otherwise everything's been cut off basically. So we're going to come back now and get out there. Keep in mind, they called it the chess game. Originally, Disney said you won the chess game. One of their attorneys had have a tape call with them saying you won the chess game because you um, did all these interviews and things. So uh, people are understanding and getting on board those that use the critical thinking. So Hollywood knows I wrote it and they talk about that. And that's how they, as a recruiting ploy, you know, come to us that know you're the author. We respect you. Public won't. They'll never know. So that's one of their ploys to try to get you in. Um, I wrote because I thought audiences were smart. Hopefully people will get this and use critical thinking and see the evidence for themselves. One matchup, maybe pass it off high school. Maybe, maybe your high school. Think of it. Your high school in the matrix. Would you be surprised if your high school's there? Would you be surprised if your high school dad's name, fiance's birthday, your birthday, your name and TA, your initials, age and date on the column. Would you be surprised about that? So basically everything's there. So that's what I'm saying, Chad, but thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you, Tom. My pleasure. Appreciate it.